Let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer and let's ask God to touch and bless this service today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we truly celebrate the Lord that you're no longer dead, but that you are alive. And Lord Jesus, like the song says, it says you are alive forevermore. And Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, that your life lives in your people today. Lord, touch every heart in this service. Bless each person in a special way on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn and shake hands with at least five people and, and also cross the aisle and find somebody and introduce yourself to them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me make mention before we start the service that if uh, you're a parent and you need a need of a nursery today, uh, we have signs posted as you go out that door. It'll kind of direct you around the building to the nursery that's provided this morning. If, if you would like to take advantage of that, that would be great. And uh, we appreciate each and every one of you. Also, let me make mention that sometime during this service, if you would, if you're a first-time visitor here at First Assembly, we have a visitor's card. It should be located on either side of the hill. the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. If you'd like to, just raise your hands towards heaven or raise your heart towards the Lord today. Now let's just praise Him together. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Verse number two. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. with me and talks with me along life's narrow 
loud noises and such throughout the program. And uh, if, it, if, if it's bothering your little one, you're more than welcome to use the nursery. Hallelujah. How many one more time is thankful for all that Jesus has done for you? Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles and you would like to follow along, if you would open up those Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Hallelujah. The Bible says these words, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, I've been around almost 30 years and we've traveled all across this nation from the East Coast to the West Coast. And I have a great desire someday to take a trip and go overseas. That day hasn't come yet. I can think of all these great trips that we'd be able to take maybe someday. But this morning we want to take you on the greatest trip that you'll probably ever go on in all of your life. We want to take you on a trip that takes you back over 2,000 years ago to the time when Jesus walked on the face of the earth. We've entitled this illustrated sermon this morning, Jesus, the Ultimate Sacrifice. If there was ever a sacrifice in all of history, the sacrifice that Jesus gave of giving himself was the greatest sacrifice there has ever been or shall ever be. We want you to sit back and especially open up your hearts and just soak it in and see what Jesus did for you. Sit back and enjoy. Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus, he'll forgive you. 
No, he won't. You don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. He'll forgive you. No, he can't forgive me. He can't forgive me. I'm unforgivable. I'm unforgivable. So Peter runs out crying and weeping. The Bible says that Jesus had told him, he said, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. Peter followed that prophecy. He denied his Lord and his Savior. And at this point in his life, he feels completely unforgivable. That there's no way that he could be redeemed to his Lord again. And there's times that many of us feel like we're unforgivable. People that have never come to Christ feel like they cannot be forgiven. Their sins are so great, so many, that they can't come to the Lord. And there's people sitting in our pews today who are Christians that have let sin creep back into their life, and now, now they feel unforgivable. They feel like they've denied Jesus. But yet the Bible tells me these words. In 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says that if we have sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You may feel a lot of misery in your life. You may feel unforgivable. But you can know today that Jesus will truly forgive you. He'll truly forgive you. If you could only see what Jesus has done for you. If you could just witness and see with your own eyes what Jesus went through for you. You'd realize that you can be forgiven. If you could only see. If you could only see. I'm sorry. 
you realize what happened? As Jesus and Barabbas stood before Pilate, Pilate called out to the people, Who should I release? As it was that time during the feast that one would be released unto the people. And they cried out, Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! And then they cried again, Crucify Jesus! Yet Jesus was without sin. No fault was found in him. And Pilate had no choice but to release Barabbas, a murderer, a thief, a fornicator, was released unto the people. He was bound with ropes, but he was loosed from his bondage, and he went out of here free, all because Jesus took his place on the cross. If anybody should have went to the cross, it should have been Barabbas. If anybody should have to pay for their sins, it should be you and it should be me. But thanks be to God, Jesus took our place. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it talks about Jesus. It says, He Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree. Jesus truly took our place. You may be seated here this morning. You may have a lot of burdens, a lot of sorrows. You may feel like your life is loaded down with much guilt and with much sin. But you can walk out of this place with those things that have bound you for years. They can fall to your feet and you can walk out of here free just like Barabbas walked out of here free. He can take your load. He can take your guilt. One day as a little boy, our family, we had gone to town and, and bought groceries and took them back to the farm. And I remember crawling up on the back of the pickup truck and grabbing a big sack of groceries as a little boy. And began to carry those groceries the best I could to the house, but the sack was so heavy I couldn't carry it. And my dad, he came up to me and he put his big muscular arms around the sack and he lifted it up and he said here this is too heavy for you I'll carry the sack and there's lots of you that have carried burdens and guilt and condemnation in your life for years and it's like a heavy sack that you have to carry but yet Jesus paid it all for you he'll take your place he'll carry your burdens he'll place them on the cross so that you have not to worry about your burdens or strife any longer thank God Jesus took my place
says that they took thorns. They twisted the thorns. They made a crown of it. They placed it on the head of Jesus. Not only did they place it there, but they pushed the thorns into his skull until blood began to trickle down his face. They say that they whipped Jesus. They flogged him. Physicians today would say that the beating that Jesus took, all of his internal organs were showing before ever going to the cross. They say that Jesus was actually in critical condition before his hands were even nailed to the old rugged tree. You say this morning, there's a lot of pain in my life. I've gone through a lot of hurting I've gone through a lot of sorrow and I can't find anyone to understand my pain. You've gone to psychiatrists and psychologists. You've gone to counselors, whether they're from the world or whether they're even from the church. And you still can't find anyone who can understand the pain that you're in. The Bible says these words in Isaiah 53, 3. It talks about Jesus again. That he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Sure, the Jesus I serve today is full of victory, but he knew grief and he knew pain. And he knows the pain that you feel. He knows the sorrow that's in your life. I remember at the age of 16 years old, my brother, being 22 years old, came down with a rare blood poisoning, spent five weeks in the hospital. At the end of that five weeks, he passed away. And you talk about pain. My family and I felt pain. And I tried to turn to all kinds of things to take care of that pain. But the only one who could really caused my pain to go was Jesus and you say that sounds ridiculous how can he take my pain away simply because he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief he knows what you face and what you go through and Jesus he can take your pain thank God for the crown of thorns and for the flogging that he received thank God for the old Rugged cross.
and they're crying, hoping that they could just get a little closer and try to comfort him. And I see Peter, Peter that has come to the foot of the cross. Just moments ago, he felt like he was unforgivable. But now he's seen what Jesus has done for him. And I'm sure now he knows he can be forgiven. see Simon of Cyrene, the man that carried the cross of Christ. His heart is aching as he sees his Lord hanging on the cross. And the two thieves that committed crimes worthy of death hanging on both sides of Jesus. Guilty. Guilty for what they did. Yet Jesus, the Lamb of God, on a cross. And these soldiers that drove the nails in his hands, putting him on the cross, those wicked men, they stood here and they mocked my Lord. And there's people throughout churches today that hear the gospel message and they mock the message of God. They laugh at it. But unless they repent, and give their lives to God just like these soldiers. Someday they'll stand in judgment. This sight. I can't turn away from this sight. It's as if Jesus is saying, accept me, accept me for what I've done. I can't say no to this man. Can you say no? These ladies. Can you say no? Can you turn your back from this sight? Can you turn your back from this sight? Can you, after seeing what Jesus has done for you, can you get up and walk out of this place without giving your heart and your life to Jesus and begin to live for him? Can you walk out of this place? I look and I see that there's many that they've come to the cross. Many have come. All around the world, people are coming by the thousands and by the millions and receiving Christ as their Savior. They're coming to the cross. Why, in Africa alone, over 20,000 people every single day are born again into the kingdom of heaven. Yet I find there's so many that have come, yet there's still room. There's still room for more. Somebody might ask, is this church too big? Is your son saved? Is your daughter saved? Couldn't we make room 
for even one more to come to the cross. Paul, there's still room. Would you come? There's room at the cross. If we 
truly want to be close to Jesus, we must get them out of the way. We come a little closer to Jesus. And all the joy that I feel as I get closer, and the joy you'll feel if you'll remove the stones from your life and come a little closer to Jesus. The glory that I feel as I stand in his presence. There's no other feeling that can describe the feeling I feel now as I'm close to my Lord. And oh, I see his blood. As they drove the nails in his hands, as they whipped his back, as they pushed the crown of thorns into his skull, the blood trickles down his body lands in a pile on the rocks. The Bible tells me that without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's many people today that they believe if you simply join a church that your sins are forgiven and that you'll go to heaven. There's people today that believe that if you just follow a prophet, and read another testament and join a church that you'll go to heaven. But yet the Bible is strictly against that and teaches us that it's only by the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away and that makes us clean. The only way that you can get to heaven is to ask Jesus to come into your heart and into your life and ask him to wash your sins away with his blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Jesus. The other denied him. It's your choice. You can deny him or you can accept him. You say, I've got to change my life. There's habits and things in my life. I must quit before I can start to serve God. Yet this man, he didn't have the time to change his life. He didn't have the time to start going to church and to start doing right. But he came to Jesus just as he was. And Jesus took him and accepted him. And that's exactly what he'll do for you. 
There's many that they've, you may have tried to change your life and you've said, I'm going to change my life and then I'm going to start to go to church. And you've said this for years and that day hasn't happened yet. But if you'll come to Jesus just like you are, like the thief, he'll accept you and he'll take you and he will change your life. He will change your life. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit.
if they don't believe in a higher power. There's people as well today that they'll believe in their church's prophet. Yet their prophet is dead. Before we began into the ministry, I was visiting with a friend of mine and I just asked him one day, who do you pray to? He told me who he prayed to and I said, is this person dead or alive? He said, well, this person is dead. I said, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is alive. That's who I pray to. Why waste your time praying to somebody who's dead? Pray to the risen Son of God who is alive. Say it with me this morning. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Say it again. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. We can have victory today. Why? Because Jesus truly is alive. Thanks be to God that he lives. Say it again, he's alive. He's alive. Hallelujah. 
How many loves Jesus with all your heart? Let me see your hands. Hallelujah. I want us this morning to do one thing. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. We're going to pray a prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come today. Lord Jesus, we rejoice. Lord, that you truly are alive. Hey, Lord Jesus, you're no longer in the grave like Peter said. You have risen. And Jesus, we want to thank you for that. But Lord Jesus, there might be some here this morning that they've never invited Christ to come into their hearts or into their lives. Or maybe somebody today, they, they might want to rededicate their life unto you and to start afresh and anew with the Lord Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're in this building this morning. And you say, I've never received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never accepted him for what he's done on the cross for me. I felt unforgivable, like I couldn't have a changed life. I couldn't have a new life because of the things I've done. But you realize now, just like millions others around the world have realized that they can be forgiven. And you want Jesus to forgive you and to come into your heart and to live in your heart this morning. Maybe that's your prayer, that's your desire. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm just gonna ask you to do one thing this morning. If that's your prayer, if you really wanna ask Jesus, come in. Friendly, we'll see you at the football. 